Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining this Global Investigative Journalism Network webinar on investigating wildlife trafficking. My name is James Fahn. I'm the Executive Director of Internews' Earth Journalism Network. I'm also a lecturer on environmental reporting at the Graduate School of Journalism at the University of California at Berkeley. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you again for joining us. Wildlife trafficking, as you probably know, is a global and hugely profitable uh, criminal network with, with opportunities for investigation in many countries, from digging into corruption and, and into these criminal networks to exposing disinformation about the, quote, healing properties of products derived from wildlife, to documenting how poverty drives poaching, the potential for investigative reporting is vast. It's important to remember too, that about 1 million animal and plant species are threatened with extinction. According to a 2019 United Nations report, the illegal trafficking of wildlife is hugely damaging to biodiversity worldwide and also contributes to the spread of zoonotic diseases caused by pathogens that spread between animals and people. And of course, we're all suffering under a current pandemic caused by a zoonotic disease. So there are lots of reasons we wanna, we wanna tackle this subject. As we mentioned, it's important for biodiversity. We, we wanna protect animals. I think a lot of us uh, care for other species and realize we, we need to protect them. We wanna uncover corruption and these criminal networks. It's, uh, you know, I, I once tried to uh, determine exactly how big these criminal networks are. Uh, and I spoke with an expert named Adrian Reuter from Wildlife Conservation Society. He, he estimated that the global trade in, in, in wildlife averages somewhere between seven and $23 billion per year. I know that's a big range, um, but it shows kind of a lot of our uncertainty about, about the trade. Uh, that would make it the fourth largest uh, illegal trafficking, uh, uh, fourth, fourth largest network of illegal trafficking in the world after the trade in drugs, people, and weapons. But if you include the trade in timber, illegal timber and illegal fish, along with other wildlife species, then the, the, the value of this illegal trade is estimated at around $180 billion per year, which would make it the second largest uh, trafficking uh, uh, network in the world. So this is, uh, this is big business. It's big illegal business. And it's not just animals being killed, it's people are being killed as well to support this trade. So it is really an important topic and we're really glad that you're, you're interested in learning more about it. Uh, this is a probably a good point to mention that this webinar is produced in partnership with the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Many thanks to them for helping us to carry this out. Uh, we aim today to offer tips on investigative stories, research tools, how to cover trafficking at its source and follow its trade, its the supply chain essentially, and, and use social media to investigate. I'd now like to introduce today's speakers, three senior journalists with extensive experience investigating wildlife trafficking. First up is Rachel Bale. She is the executive editor of the Animals Desk at National Geographic. We all love her job title, by the way. Uh, she also manages and occasionally reports for Wildlife Watch, Nat Geo's investigative reporting project focused on wildlife crime and explo exploitation. Next up is Jesset Inano, a reporter for the Philippines Daily Inquirer, a daily English language newspaper in the Philippines. Her reporting focuses on the environment and natural resources, zeroing in on issues such as climate change, wildlife trafficking, and natural disasters. And finally, finally we have Fuka Postma, who works as a researcher and trainer at Bellingcat. He has a background in conflict analysis and resolution, and is particularly interested in environmental, military, and LGBT plus issues. Uh, before we start, just a little bit more information about the Global Investigative Journalism Network, for those of you not familiar with it. 
GIJN is the largest global network of nonprofit investigative journalism organizations with 211 member organizations in 82 countries. But it works with journalists everywhere in nonprofits, in commercial organizations, and with freelancers. It has an extensive range of resources and tip sheets to help journalists worldwide, which you can check out on gijn.org. We also want to hear from you in the audience. Please send written questions and messages in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So not in the chat, please, but in the Q&A feature that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get to as many as we can. You can start asking questions now and in any language as your questions will be translated. Uh, when the speakers are finished, uh, GI Jen's Leonardo Peralta will join us on screen to moderate the questions. Uh, before we start, I want to let you know that GI Jen has recently released a new reporting guide, Investigative Wildlife Trafficking, that's the name of it. It's aimed at journalists such as yourself seeking to report on this multi-billion dollar market. You can check it out on their website and you will find the link to it in the chat box now, you should. Uh, finally, please note, we will be recording this session for posting later on YouTube. So let's get to it. Um, and and GI Jan has asked me to just start things off with a few lessons I've learned. I won't, I won't, I won't dwell on, on that, but um, uh, my organization, uh, the Earth Journalism Network, we support a lot of investigative work into wildlife trafficking. Um, I think we found that the local press will often do a good job covering the initial busts and seizures. There'll be a press conference and the authorities will announce uh, an arrest or a seizure maybe at an airport or a port or something, but there's almost no follow-up uh, to those initial stories. And we, we don't often just don't know what happened to the criminals and we rarely get to the to the people who, who are really behind the scenes orchestrating all this uh, criminal trafficking. Um, one thing we tried to do at EJN is create uh, several geojournalism sites, as we call them, data journalism sites uh, called Wild Eye. You can look it up at hashtag Wild Eye. Uh, and these have data on all these arrests, seizures, criminal cases, and, and tries to follow the case through to their kind of conclusion. Um, so uh, we have Wild Eye sites currently in Europe and in Asia, we're trying to set one up uh, later this year in East Africa. So these are opportunities you can check in, check them out for for investigative journalists to learn about what's happening in your region. Um, and uh, and and if you're interested in learning more, by the way, about the Earth Journalism Network, uh, if you want to do more reporting on environment or climate issues, please check us out at www.earthjournalism.net. It's uh, all professional journalists are free and welcome to register. Uh, the other, one of the other things, well, we've learned about investigative journalism at, at the risk of seeming obvious, it's uh, you need to find your allies. You, you need to find the sources that potentially want to talk to you. And no matter how daunting it may seem, they are out there. There are people who do want to uh, expose these networks, expose this criminal trade. And, um, and that's actually a good uh, opportunity for us to turn things over to Rachel. She's going to talk about how to find stories, how to how to find your sources. And um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Rachel. Would you like to take it away, please? Hey, thank you. OK, I'm going to share my screen. One second. And start the presentation. OK, can everybody see? Okay, I'm gonna assume yes, stop me if you can't. Um, okay, so again, my name is Rachel Bale. I'm the executive editor of um, the Animals Desk at National Geographic. So I oversee all of our um, animal reporting, including we do a lot with our wildlife watch project, as James mentioned, wildlife crime and exploitation, especially with the illegal wildlife trade. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, getting started looking for stories. So when, if you're just starting to get into this kind of reporting, 
it's important when you're looking for stories first to understand your own situation first. Or, and I mean, I know this is true for pretty much any kind of reporting, um, but think about first whether your audience is local, regional, national, national or international. So for example, like at National Geographic, we get a ton of really great story pitches that are just, you know, too local or regional for our audience, but are actually really good stories that somebody should be telling. Um, and you can start by thinking about what's happening that's relevant to your audience. So where you live or for the audience you're reporting to, are there certain national parks, reserves, um, you know, important species that are of significant, uh, that are of significance to your audience or certain animals that are at particular risk in your country. That's always a great place to start um, if you're, you know, just sort of at a loss, like, you know, 101, what am I gonna do first? It's also really important when you get started with this kind of reporting to get to know what laws govern wildlife conservation and also specifically the wildlife trade in your country. Um, there's CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, um, which is an international treaty that governs trade across borders. But in order to do a story on the illegal wildlife trade, you need to have a good understanding of what's actually illegal and what's legal in your country. So first of all, this is not an exhaustive list, but um, this is sort of a broad landscape of some of the types of stories you could do on the illegal wildlife trade. Um, in reality, most stories are a blend of all of these things. Um, but first you can do, Think about the supply chain um, when it comes to illegal wildlife trade. There are stories to be told at every step along the way. So you've got the poaching, taking animals from the wild and killing them. You have the transportation part. How are the animals or the wildlife products being moved? And then you have the end use part, the sales, who's buying them? Why are they buying them? What's the market look like? And throughout all of this, also keep in mind, you know, the illegal wildlife trade includes wildlife parts and products like ivory or, you know, traditional medicines that contain rhino horn or pangolin scales, but then also live animals. You've got the exotic pet trade, trade for zoos and aquariums, personal wildlife collections, things like that. Uh, you can also base your stories on around a character. So for example, that character could be a particular species. It could be the criminals anywhere along the supply chain, the poachers, uh, the smugglers. Uh, consumer stories, I think, are always really interesting. Again, getting into why are people buying these things? And then the helpers. I don't know if um, anybody here is familiar with uh, Solutions Journalism Network, but it's a another organization that's focused um, on helping people understand how to tell stories about solutions. And it's not just like, here's what you can do to help, but it's taking a critical look at some of the things that are being done to solve a particular problem and then analyzing them uh, in like a very critical way. And that's, I think, wildlife trade stories can be incredibly depressing and they can be um, you know, discouraging if you're doing it day in and day out. And sometimes looking, looking at the helpers, looking at the possible solutions is a really nice way to get an audience interested in a wildlife crime story without, um, you know, making them so depressed that they don't want to read it at all. It's going to come as no surprise that some of the best stories um, you're going to find are going to come from tips or even just random conversations with people who work in the relevant fields. So of course, like any kind of reporting to find the best stories, you need to develop a deep pool of sources. So this is um, a very general overview list of places to start, relationships you might wanna start building if you're interested in this kind of reporting, people to talk to. So of course the government, um, if you can, look at your environment ministry or agency at the national level, usually, uh, depending on the country, but usually the National Wildlife Regulatory Organization is going to fall under your environment ministry. 
um, the foreign policy ministry, whoever uh, in the national governments dealing with international relations is also likely gonna be involved in wildlife trade issues. Same with Customs and Border Protection because they're often the ones who are finding the illegal products and confiscating them. Law enforcement, both at the local level and at the national level, I really wanna enforce the local level here because it's, it's the people on the ground who are dealing um, with the very localized issues who often know things the best, but also the justice system, you know, prosecutors, uh, investigators, people like that. And then again, your local wildlife authorities, park rangers, fish and game departments, things like that. Again, there's so many nonprofits, so many NGOs who love to talk about wildlife crime issues. So starting to develop relationships with these people are a great way to find stories, again, local, regional, and international. Uh, you know, it kind of goes without saying, but local NGOs are gonna be the ones who are most familiar with the issues in your community specifically. So that's a good source to go to um, if you're looking for emerging patterns, for example, in your community. National and international NGOs, on the other hand, while they might not be as familiar with issues that are specific to your audience, they're fantastic for putting things in context. And then academics. So you've got your standard, you know, look for, look for people at universities or for PhD candidates who are working in the fields. Getting to know these people and staying up to date on their research is another really good way to find stories. So of course you've got the people who are, you know, studying biology, zoology, and ecology, and all of those sort of science-based um, fields. But I think often there's an emerging field called green criminology. A couple of universities now have programs like this, but these are people who are studying the criminology of environmental crime, in particular, uh, wildlife crime, but they're fantastic because they study crime and criminals as a social phenomenon. So you're going to get an entirely different insight and an entirely different point of view and possibly different story ideas by talking to people who are studying criminology. Same with criminal justice. That's more, you know, the application, like what's happening in the courts. Social scientists too. I've found that increasingly people on the social science side are starting to talk more to people on the hard science side when it comes to wildlife trade. But the social scientists are people who will be able to give you insights and story ideas um, about motives and causes, for example, that are driving the illegal wildlife trade. Data and public records is also a great place to look for stories. Uh, public Records laws vary from country to country, so get an understanding of what yours are. But, you know, a couple places you can start. The CITES trade database is online. It has, you know, plenty of its own problems for anybody who's ever looked at it, but it is a good place to start to see what kinds of animals are being legally traded across borders. And once you have an understanding of what's actually happening, what's happening, you know, on the public legal level, it can give you some hints as to what might be happening that's not being recorded. Uh, similarly, court records, police reports. Find out um, what your government requires, what paperwork your government requires when somebody wants to import or export wildlife. In the US, the Fish and Wildlife Service requires anybody who's importing or exporting wildlife to file what's called Form 3177. And those are all kept in a single database called Lemus. And you can just request, you know, give me every, every import of this animal from this date to this date. It can be really interesting to see what's coming in. Um, so yeah, basically the takeaway there is get to know what your country's wildlife laws are, your country's wildlife trade laws, and then learn what bureaucracy goes along with it. Once you understand the paperwork that goes with it, you'll know which kinds of records you can be looking for. Um, and then of course, um, I won't go into this because I think it's kind of obvious, 
but talk to the people who live alongside the wildlife because they're the ones who are going to know what's going on better than anyone else. So lastly, let's get really specific. I wanted to end my section of this webinar with a couple little seedlings of ideas for anybody who wants to put this into practice right away and get started with some stories. Find out if you can shadow a wildlife inspector at a port of entry. It's super fun. You can see what they do every day. You can get to know them. I mean, it's really important. Even if you don't walk away from a story, you'll end that time with a really good relationship with somebody who's gonna be potentially a source for you in the future. You can see what's coming in, uh, what challenges they face, and I'm sure you'll hear some crazy stories. Similarly, you can request to go on patrol with a wildlife ranger or game warden. Exact, exactly the same thing. Um, see what their challenges are, see what kinds of wildlife they're most concerned about, what patterns they see are emerging. And again, if you don't get a story, you've at least established trust with somebody who can become a good source in the future. Public records requests we just talked about. I especially like to look specifically at things that people have tried to import that law enforcement then seized. So, you know, if you can, people will try to import things legally. Um, so they'll fill out the paperwork, but then when law enforcement takes a look at it or when a wildlife inspector at a port of entry takes a look at it and realizes something's not right, they'll take it. And those records can give you a lot of insight. Um, and you never know what's gonna show up in those. You can see all kinds of weird things. I mean, this is, we once did a story on the seizure of like thousands of medicinal leeches, leeches that suck blood for medical use. Um, so, you know, all kinds of funny things. If you live in a, a place with markets that sell wild meat or wildlife-based medicinal products, just walk around and get a feel for what's out there. You know, maybe what's on display is more likely gonna be legal than illegal, but it'll still give you some insights into what's in demand, what kinds of things people are willing to sell above board and might give you some hints about what people are also selling, you know, out the back door. And lastly, this one's one of my favorites. Examine loopholes in your country's hunting, breeding, and wildlife ownership laws. So, for example, think about, find out if there are ever examples or instances, exceptions to your country's endangered species protection laws in which an endangered species is legally allowed to be killed or legally allowed to be traded. Because whenever there are those exceptions, that's often where you're most likely going to find somebody who's abusing those exceptions. So uh, one example I'll give you. <clears throat> Around 2006, uh, Vietnamese criminal networks trading in rhino horns started sending their people to South Africa to go on rhino trophy hunts. Now, trophy hunting rhino in South Africa is perfectly legal. You get a permit, you hire a professional hunter to go with you. Once you've killed your rhino, you get an export permit because it was part of hunting, so you're allowed to export it and bring it home. All of that's above board. But what these criminal networks started doing was they started hiring people to go on the hunts, not actually for the hunt itself, but because they wanted, uh, they needed a legal reason to be able to export rhino horn. At one point, I believe uh, one network hired some Thai prostitutes and strippers to be the hunters. I see some of you guys nodding, you're familiar with this story. Um, so there's a really good example of somebody figuring out how to exploit an exemption or a loophole leading to a really, really great story. Similarly, um, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with the Tiger Temple in Thailand. It was a really famous um, tourism facility um, marketed as a sanctuary. People could go and could go and see the tigers and how them, it was all run by monks, how, people, how the monks take care of them. 
It had been under suspicion of wildlife trafficking uh, for a really long time, selling tigers and tiger parts on the down low. And at one point, finally, authorities had enough um, had enough evidence to go in there and raid the facility and seize the tigers. And they did indeed find lots of evidence that the monks had been trafficking in tiger parts. But all this is to say, the facility was in many ways operating above board. They had the permits to operate. Um, I don't remember if they had a zoo permit or a sanctuary permit. I can't remember the exact um, situation in Thailand, but they had the permits and that allowed them to exploit them. So that's another reason, get to know what your wildlife laws are, especially around hunting, breeding, and ownership, because as soon as you can figure out what those exemptions are, you're gonna find people who are avoiding them. That is all I have. Happy to answer questions. Here's my contact information if you wanna reach out later, but um, I hope that was helpful. That was very helpful, Rachel. Thank you so much. Uh, I do wanna ask one quick question just cause I, I you know, don't wanna to dwell too long, but you are one of the foremost editors on this topic in the world. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on particular areas of the wildlife trade that are going underreported, maybe particular regions where there's not a lot of attention on at the moment or particular trends in wildlife, particular species that you're seeing that uh, maybe people don't realize uh, as a growing, growing uh, source, source of trafficking. Do you have any thoughts as, as an editor, what, what you might be looking for at the moment? Mm -hmm. So one thing I've learned from doing this for several years now is that there's a market for almost any animal you can think of. One time I was joking, I think, to my family about how, you know, name an animal and there's a market for it. I'm yes. sure there's a market for ants. Later on, I found out there's a market for ants. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> I'm always interested in, in the weird ones. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of coverage of rhinos and tigers and elephants. I want the stories that of, you know, maybe endemic species that most people haven't heard of. Um, I'm trying to think, I can't think of any emerging things off the top of my head, but there's always something. And that's why actually people who report for regional papers, local papers, um, and even non, uh, just any kind of non-national newspaper, you guys are the ones who are going to be finding the stories way before I do. I have Google alerts set up and read the English language versions of newspapers from around the world, because that's where the trends are first identified. So look for those stories, look for the stories that you're not seeing in the national media. I don't know if that doesn't really answer your question, but that's... Oh, that's, thank you. Yeah, I think it's <laughs> true. It's, uh, you know, look at the specialty press in, in all kinds of environmental topics. They often have the stories first before they hit the mainstream media and that that can be a really good way to check out trends, whether it's in wildlife trafficking or probably any topic. Thank you again, Rachel. We're gonna move on to our next speaker, Jessit Inano, and she's gonna talk about how to work with NGOs, how to follow the people trail, and to, to look at wildlife trafficking from a, of a, from a bigger picture with a larger narrative. Jessit, you wanna take it away, please. Thanks so much, James. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, allow me to share my screen. I hope everyone can see that. I'm also just going to assume that everyone does and please uh, tell me if you don't. So um, once again, my name is Josette Anano. I am an environment reporter from the Philippine Daily Inquirer. So right now I'm speaking to you from Manila, Philippines. Um, and I'd like to share with you, just as James has mentioned, some of the challenges and lessons that I've learned um, in reporting about wildlife crime. 
And so I'd like to just give you a bit of a background of the work that I do. So I have been reporting on wildlife crime since 2019 and really just focusing on a lot of the different um, topics um, that intersect with um, wildlife trafficking and illegal wildlife trade. So for instance, I was able to look at it from the economic perspective, looking at what the Philippines or how much the Philippines is just losing yearly because of the illegal wildlife trade transitioning also to looking at how social media, um, if you know the Philippines is one of the, I think, biggest communities in Facebook, it is dubbed as the social media capital of the world. So it was quite interesting to see how wildlife traders um, have been pivoting towards using this new platform to continue their trade. And just recently in, in collaboration with, with the Oxpecker Center in, in South Africa, I was able to look into the legalities of wildlife crime here in the Philippines, where um, I, I, find, I found out in my reporting that um, even though that the law has been there for quite some time, uh, wildlife criminals in the Philippines still get uh, slaps on the wrist. So basically they, they get away with murder, um, as they say. Um, and these are just interesting intersections when we look at wildlife trade because oftentimes there is a tendency to look at it from just a small perspective. Okay, it's one story of enforcement, one story of rescue, one story of seizure. But it is interesting to also look at it from the different intersections and the factors that play out on how wildlife trafficking really is a story not just about the environment, but the story of us, the story of people, the story of how we interact with our natural resources. So I'd like to walk you through some of the challenges that I've faced um, in my reporting um, and also some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. So first on dealing with the flora and fauna. Um, I realized that there is often a tendency to focus on the charismatic and the famous animals and plants. Um, to be quite frank, I think animals are at an advantage because they usually get talked about more when it comes to wildlife trade and illegal um, trade and wildlife trafficking. There's not much um, spotlight, I think, um, on plants, on timber. And interestingly, um, because of the pandemic, more and more people have been amassing plants. And now in the Philippines, we have actual plant poachers. And so it's, it's interesting to, to look at other stories that do not focus on the cute animals. I know the photo that I, I have I shared with you on the screen is very cute. It's a Palawan bear cat. It is uh, endemic in, in Palawan. Uh, but um, there is really just a tendency to really zero in on particular trophy animals. You have pangolins, tigers, rhinos, elephants, Philippine eagle for the Philippines, and maybe some other famous um, animals in your country. And so that's a challenge that I've seen. And another one is going beyond the case-to-case -case seizures and rescues. Um, as mentioned by Rachel earlier, usually um, reporters like me, since I do still do my daily beat reporting for the newspaper, often there's a tendency to really just focus on a single enforcement. For example, there's um, um, a trafficker that was, that was caught in a checkpoint, but often there is not a lot of focus or following up on, on what's happening with the case. Were they able to actually prosecute um, this trafficker? And of course, another challenge for journalists, especially those who are um, just entering the foray of wildlife trafficking is the knowledge about the wildlife itself and the ecosystems that, that they um, um, live in. And so what are some of the lessons that I've learned um, looking at these challenges ahead? So I've always found myself asking which animals or plants are being underreported? What are those that kind of fly or crawl, if you may, under the radar? And which ones deserve more attention? Um, the second question kind of has some new ones to it. You would like to think, how would you define um, what animal define, uh, deserves more attention? Is it because they're um, um, symbolic of a certain country or of a certain community? Or is it because they're being um, used in, in, you know, by, in a traditional culture of indigenous peoples? And so it, it is interesting to, to look at these um, issues from these perspective so that we will be also able to, to allow more new ones um, in, in our reportage. And I've also learned that it's really important to focus on looking at the bigger picture. Um, we may see um, from time to time a certain case happening here and then another case happening there. But if, if you'd have your Google alerts on, um, on wildlife trafficking, eventually you would learn to see some patterns 
some trends in your reporting. And this is not limited to your country alone because wildlife trafficking is a transboundary crime. It is ever more important that we look at it from a transboundary perspective. So what is happening in your region? So for example, the Philippines has a very crucial role in, in wildlife trade because it's not only a source point, but is, it is also a destination for some animals and at the same time, it is also a transshipment point because it has very porous boundaries. And so it will, it will be also good to look at, at what's happening in your region. Um, I do know that some of the animals that are being trafficked in the Philippines actually do not originate from the Philippines. Rather, they come from places as far as um, Indonesia or Papua New Guinea. And then they get trafficked to even farther places, such as um, not just in China or in Vietnam, but even as far as Europe and the United States. And of course, as you are going um, um, with your reporting, it is important that you equip yourself with the knowledge about the wildlife. And to do that, it's not just simply you know, desk research, but of course, that's, that's one good thing to put your foot in the door, but also establishing strong relationships with experts and resource persons, and even the communities that live with these animals. Now on following the people. So we've talked about the animals and the plants and now let's talk about the people. So what are some of the challenges that I've dealt in my reporting um, when it comes to people trail? So number one is, uh, I think this is uh, uh, an issue for a lot of the journalists. I think not just um, for those working on wildlife but on other issues, which is access. And in illegal wildlife um, trafficking or illegal wildlife trade, it's often the challenge to access um, wildlife law enforcers. Either they don't want to speak with you or they don't want to share information with you. And of course, another challenge there is if you really want to speak with traffickers or with poachers, um, either those um, that you have developed in your reporting, those you have um, come across with in, in, in your field work or in your legwork, or those that have been arrested by the wildlife law enforcers. And of course, there's a challenge in communicating with some of the communities that are um, living um, with the animals because there is um, there's a tendency or there may be a tendency that these same communities are the ones that are actually involved in wildlife trade. And so the question is, how do you get them to speak with you? How do you build trust? So it all boils down to really finding the right people to talk to for your story. And so I've learned that persistence and consistency are key to establishing trust between you and your sources. Um, as much as possible, um, if you could dedicate your time to really keep close touch with wildlife law enforcers, for instance, whether they're in the Justice Department or of course, not just in the Environment Ministry, but also those working, for example, in money laundering or in, in the courts, because uh, they too are involved in, in um, prosecuting and running after wildlife criminals. And so it, it's really helpful to touch base with them from time to time. Don't just reach out to them when you're doing your reporting. Um, as, as Rachel actually shared earlier, you know, shadowing them if they would allow you to just kind of, I know it's kind of different because of the pandemic, but if the pandemic is over, you could just drop by their office and just say hello, you know, ask if there are any cases that they're following up. So these are just um, really important like tidbits that you can remember as you go along because eventually when you're able to build this relationship or this trust with your sources, they'll find it, um, they'll be more confident to share more information with you, which you could use um, maybe not in that particular story that you're trying to, to follow up, but in future stories that you wanna work on. And when um, communicating or engaging with perhaps poachers or the communities or perhaps the, the, the overlap there, uh, and when I say overlap, perhaps some communities that find themselves engaged in poaching. Uh, it's really important to remember that stories are not simply black and white. Um, you have to look out for the nuances. Uh, what do I mean by that? For example, in the Philippines, um, the, the poachers really, uh, the ones that really, uh, you know, comb the forest to, to look for animals that will eventually be sold to middlemen and then to, to the actual buyers. They're not the ones who are amassing great amounts of money for, for the illegal or for the crime that they're doing. Often these communities are being used also by, you know, the big traffickers, the actual smugglers, because these communities, for example, in the case of the Philippines, um, often there are indigenous peoples. They're the ones who are really in touch um, with their environment. They know where their, the animals um, 
live, they know the, the um, habitats of the animals, the habits of the animals. And so we have to look at it from, from that picture that it's not simply a hero and a villain. It's not simply as a person doing a good thing or a person doing a crime or a bad thing. But um, it helps that we look at the other factors that, that surround this. Like, why are these communities being pushed into, into poaching? And I've learned that in my reporting that they're really at the losing end um, of, of, of this supply chain. Essentially, they are given almost nothing for such a big crime that, that's, that's being you know, put on them. Um, and and, and, the, and it's, it's important to look at that from that perspective because you would see that it's not just simply an issue of crime. It's, 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 it's an issue of poverty. It's an issue of their economic situations. Um, and these are some of the nuances that we should also be able to highlight in our reporting. And um, on, on following up um, um, information for your reporting, you could also reach out to some experts and groups that are working around the peripheries of wildlife crime. And I mentioned peripheries because um, you're not just dealing, of course, with the law enforcers themselves, but you can actually, and as Rachel mentioned, reach out to the academe, to the nonprofits, and even to the advocates themselves. Um, sometimes the advocates do not come in form of like big groups, like you know, organizations. Often these are just really civilians that are very much interested in protecting the environment and saving the animals. And you would find them to be great allies um, in the reporting that you do. And of course, um, as I'm going through this, I just also want to highlight that your safety as a journalist, of course, is paramount. You have to make sure that when you're doing your uh, reporting, when you're out there in the field, that you understand the risks that um, come along with, with the job that you are doing. Um, for the case of the Philippines, for, in for instance, it's, it's not just one of the most dangerous um, countries for journalists in the world, but it is also among the most dangerous countries in the world for environmental defenders. And so if you're a journalist working on environmental issues, you're kind of in a double jeopardy there. And so it is really important that you consider all of these risks, work with your editors, your newsroom managers, when you're doing this kind of reporting. And when even before you go out um, to the field to to follow up on certain issues or, or to even to shadow a certain law enforcer. So it's really important that you consider that um, before you do your reporting. And finally, on, on working with documents or paper trail. So one of the challenges, and this is something that has come across, I think, in most of the webinars on uh, I've attended uh, with environmental reporters um, working on, on um, wildlife crime, is really the access to data and other pertinent information. And the coronavirus pandemic has really made that access uh, you know, much harder. Um, either, of course, the restrictions on, on actually uh, traveling to offices, filing requests and reports, and even just simply following up through email and telephone. Uh, it's much easier for, for um, government offices to ignore um, our requests to even just speak with them or to request for a particular document. But beyond access, um, another challenge is the absence of the actual data. So some, I, I do know that in, in, in the Philippines, there is no centralized agency that tracks um, wildlife crime. So in my reporting, I've had to uh, reach out to different uh, sources, both from government and non-government um, organizations for me to be able to have that big picture of, of how wildlife crime is you know, being prosecuted in the Philippines. And once you do get that data, another challenge is finding out that there are gaps and inconsistencies in the data. Some government agencies may have the database that you need, but you would find out that there are certain years that some numbers just feel off, that some of the data just, uh, you know, it doesn't agree with the other um, uh, information that you have on hand. And of course, as, as you go along there, um, you would also find that there's also a challenge in actually following the money. Um, because wildlife uh, crime is a transboundary crime, uh, money laundering has been um, another uh, layer that kind of complicates uh, or introduces complexities in that entire um, process. 
And so some of the lessons that I've learned in dealing with, with documents in reporting about wildlife trafficking is it's really important to build a consistent coverage on wildlife crime. Um, I haven't been here, I haven't been doing this for, for a very long time, but even in the two years, two, three years that I've been following up on wildlife crime, I was already able to see the trends and the patterns that are happening. I, I have an idea of, of what um, particular species are often traded, which which ones are, are you know, easily sleeping, slipping through our borders. And so it is kind of just important to keep that eye on, on what's happening, um, even if you're not really following up a particular story, because you may be able to, to use uh, the data and the information that um, you're gathering through, you know, your consistent coverage um, for your future story. So I do know that some journalists um, build their own data sets, their own databases when it comes to dealing with um, stories on wildlife trafficking, and that's that's the response to to the absence of of official data or at least a consistent um, and accurate data from from government agencies. Um, it is also uh, important to find other sources of reliable information. So, for example, you have your academe, you have your research groups. Um, in the resource guide um, by the GIJN, they were able to uh, come up with this really great master list of different nonprofits that have been working on on you know compiling data and information on wildlife trafficking. So, for example, um, one organization that I found myself. Um, um, really working with uh, in terms of um, wildlife trafficking in the Philippines is Traffic. Um, it's an international organization that really looks into wildlife crime. And so it is also really important to establish um, connection with, with these organizations that can also help you in your reporting. And I'd also like to emphasize the importance of collaboration. Um, James mentioned this um, as he opened the the webinar earlier of how important it is to find allies in your reporting. Um, it is, there is a tendency to feel that the, the reporting that you do is kind of a lonely job if you're probably one of the few reporters in your country who's actually interested in reporting about animals when other people would rather report about politics or anything else that might you know feel more interesting than just animals being you know trafficked and poached but um, finding these allies would really help you further your reporting, both within your newsroom and outside your newsroom. So when I say within your newsroom, um, it's really important to also find champions, you know, editors who would support the kind of reporting that you do. Not a lot of editors would probably be interested in, in publishing stories about, you know, birds and snakes and turtles. But it is also um, crucial that you find these champions in your newsroom because it's, it's that kind of collaboration that will, you know, make your reporting more solid and more accurate. Um, and at the same time, finding allies outside the newsroom. So um, there are um, several collectives um, across, you know, inter-newsroom collectives who have been working on wildlife trafficking stories. So it's also um, it's also good to to get in touch with them and see um, what kinds of reporting has been done and what else um, can you contribute. But um, talking about you know these three things, you know. Um, challenges on, you know, reporting on the flora and fauna, challenges on, you know, um, following up with people, and then the challenge of, you know, following the paper trail. I think the biggest challenge um, in doing wildlife trafficking stories is making people care, making people care about the stories that you're working on. So the big question that we have to answer, or we have to, the an we have to provide the answer to as journalists is, why does this matter? what is my place in all of this? Sure, it's another bunch of tarantulas being, you know, shipped across borders. It's another dead elephant. It's another rhinoceros without a horn. It's another bunch of frozen dead pangolins. But why does this matter to me? So I think this is um, a crucial point we should all always consider in our stories. Um, in our reporting, we should make people uh, realize their place in their ecosystem. And, and I've come across this in my reporting, one of my earliest reports in wildlife trafficking, um, when I was looking at it from the economic aspect. You know, um, there's of course a lot of numbers being tossed around, you know, how much we're losing, how much, you know, revenue is going to, to the black markets, for instance. But um, one of my sources uh, actually shared to me, like for example, 
in the Philippines, there was a year that the Toke geckos, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, they're kind of like lizards, reptiles, um, they're, they, they were poached um, from, from certain forests here in, in the Philippines. And uh, at the same time, and sci you know, research has backed this up, that at the same time that you know, these thousands of, of toke geckos were taken out from their habitat, there was a surge of, of dengue cases in those communities. And that shows you, you know, the intersections, the importance of showing why these kinds of reporting matter, because eventually when you poach you know, all of these animals, it, it, it's ultimately tied to us it's it's tied to our survival as as the human population and in that same breath i think that it is also important to highlight what is being done um i know rachel also already mentioned earlier the solutions uh, journalism network there is a tendency really for you know um wildlife trafficking to be really gory. You know, you have your harrowing pictures and stories of, of bloody animals that people sometimes feel like they're, they don't have agency over it. It's such a big crime that they just feel like spectators. But what's really important is we also show what is being done. So while some communities um, do get used by, for example, by poachers, by smugglers to do their dirty work, there are also communities that are taking the first step to protecting their environment, to protecting their ancestral lands, to protecting you know the animals that they knew that they grew up in, grew yes, up with. We're gonna have to ask you to, to stop soon. Sorry to interrupt, but we do have sure. to move on. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I I uh, I appreciate your your emphasizing these 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 issues and why it's important. And and I'm, may I say, just that we really enjoyed working with you uh, at EJN and, and helping support your story. So thank you so much for, for your work on this. And I'm, I'm actually, I'm really glad that you, you mentioned the plant poaching. Uh, one of the first stories I did as a journalist 25 years ago when I was working in Thailand was a story on the illegal trade in orchids. You know, when you see these beautiful flowering plants, <clears throat> you don't think about what lies behind them that often a lot of the, the rare and exotic species that we see uh, exhibited or, or, or in, in photos, they, they are the subject of a brutal, brutal trade. So thank you again, Jacet. Uh, I, I know we have to move on. I did wanna ask you one question, Jacet, that came in uh, while you're speaking, maybe you can answer quickly because we're running a bit behind time, but you know, do you have any thoughts on how, how journalists can cope with difficult situations investigating a case that is linked with high level government, for instance, if the authorities are involved perhaps in, in the trade, perhaps are being paid off or something. Uh, is, do you have any uh, suggestions for how, how reporters can handle that? Sure. Um, I think what's really important when, when dealing with those kinds of um, investigations is that you really involve your editors yeah. in, in, in your work. Um, Especially if if you feel like it's not it's always it's always helpful to have um, another pair of eyes uh, looking at the reporting that you're doing, just so that you're not just you know moving along with with your bias. Um, and of course, you also have to consider um, you know making sure that the information that you're receiving are verifiable. Um, so um, working with other sources who may be able to. To collab, no, not just collaborate, but corroborate. I mean, the reporting that you're doing. So yeah. Thank you, Jacet. Thanks again. Now we're gonna turn over to Fuka Posma, who's gonna talk about getting the data. So important. Fuka, please take it away. Sorry, are you seeing my screen right now? Yeah. Okay. So hi everyone. Uh, my name is Fuka Posma. And I work for Bellingcat. And if you don't know what Bellingcat is, uh, we are a investigative uh, outlet and we use open source information. That's what we're known for. And you, with open source information, you basically have to think about um, the stuff that's available online that anyone can find. So usually we make a lot of use of social media. Um, and that's what I did for this investigation as well. It, it's about celebrities in Dubai. Um, and the tigers and uh, exotic animals they pose with for Instagram posts. 
Um, and I'll take you quickly through this story uh, and explain step by step and give you some tips on how anyone can do this, because that's the advantage of doing these kinds of investigations. You only need an internet connection to do to do this. And you all probably know how to use social media. Um, so, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to this later on, but one of the advantages um, that we have with these investigations is that anyone can help. So we try to turn our readers, our, yeah, I guess, passive consumers into more active uh, when they browse Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, uh, suddenly know how they can do their own investigation and maybe um, uncover their own kind of, uh, you know, stuff that's going on in their own local communities. Um, so this is how uh, this story started for me. Uh, this is a photo posted by a Dutch celebrity. Um, he's, he plays soccer um, in the European Championship right now. Um, and he, he was in Dubai and he posted this picture on um, his Instagram and it's at his house. Um, and he later on explained it came from a zoo. And I found that weird, like which, what kind of zoo hands over a cup, you know, to, to just take photos with on Instagram. That doesn't make any sense to me. So I didn't quite trust this. Um, and as you can see, it, it's quite a popular pic. It got a million likes. Um, so I started doing a bit of research. Like I wasn't familiar with um, the wildlife scene in Dubai or the, the rules, um, but I saw there was a new law and that you couldn't just take these animals outside of zoos. Um, so the, this person, um, the celebrity, didn't share any information other than it came from a zoo. So I began doing some investigation um, and basically began looking on YouTube. Um, and simply filling in tiger, cup, and Dubai. And this is one of the first videos you will get. Uh, if you, right now, if you search that for YouTube, um, depends a bit on your location, but that this will be near the top. Um, and this is a, a celebrity vlogger in YouTube, uh, Dubai, as you can see, 10 million followers. And his little clip here, 10 minutes long, got almost 3 million views. And it shows basically him at his home and lions, uh, a lion and a tiger cup being brought over to his home and he plays around with them and he swims in the pool. Now, interestingly, if you see the description here, he thanks an account at mbe.777. Um, and this is already um, one of the tips that I want to give you is that you always have to think about the extra information that comes along with social media posts, right? So descriptions, um, mentions and whatever, because um, in the video itself, this celebrity did not explain at all who was bringing over these uh, animals or where exactly did it, they came from. So only this part in the description was a hint to me. So I searched for this and I saw that it was an account on Instagram. Um, yeah, so at mbe.777. Um, and as I started looking for this, I came across multiple posts on Instagram of celebrities uh, constantly tagging MBE777 with this little tiger cup. And so here you have an uh, Egyptian TV host, um, millions of followers. Um, this guy uh, is very popular in Saudi Arabia, like a celebrity as well. And this is, a, um, I think, a French rapper, if I'm not mistaken, also insanely popular. And as you can see, they all take a picture with a cup and they all tag MBE777. So what if you go to this account, right? To the Instagram account there. Um, oh, apologies, right. You can show uh, or you can see that these cups, if you look very closely, also all match uh, based on the stripes that they have, right? So these are zoom, uh, zoomed in versions of the cups they have here. And as you can see, the patterns all seem to match. Now, tigers don't change their stripes. So you can use uh, their uh, fur to um, match them. And as you can see, there's also other signs. So for example, an injury on the nose um, that is about to heal and um, the color of the eyes, for example. And there are a couple of other um, details that help you see that it, it's in fact the same cup that they all take MBE777 with. Um, so 
I went to this Instagram account, but it was set to private and I used an, uh, a fake account to follow him. And once he accepted me, it looked like this. So it was basically the way you have a window sh uh, shop, you know? So uh, it, you can simply browse through all the, the animals that this account had. Um, and there was no um, person, there was no uh, this profile description. Uh, you sometimes saw, you know, a glimpse of a hand, but nobody was speaking. Um, and it only showed animals all in the same room, as you can see, with the same kind of couch uh, in the room as well. So how do you go from here? Well, you can see in Instagram what kind of accounts this account itself is following. So in what kind of network is this account operating? And this account, despite being followed by thousands and thousands of people, itself, it only followed about 30 people. And many of them were celebrities that uh, were posing with these animals. Uh, but one of them was a Russian lady. And she was posting the same animals. But she also posted pictures like this, where you could look out of the window. Um, and this is uh, the second lesson that I want to give you, is that these uh, videos and photos that are online can show a lot more information if you know how to analyze them, if you know how to dig deep. So you can, for example, do a very targeted search on this sign here. And eventually you'll end up with a building in Dubai where these uh, animals were kept. So this is another video that she posted later on with the view outside of the window. You can see a Ferris wheel and you know the sea. And that makes it very easy because there aren't many Ferris wheels in Dubai. And you can simply uh, go back and see exactly um, which floor, which building, all of these animals were kept. Okay, so we went from this couch that we recognized and the animals to looking outside and from looking outside to identifying the location on Google Earth. So I still don't know who this person is. Um, so I went back to the initial video where I saw him tagged being first. Um, and like I said, he doesn't never mentions where they come from. But if you look very closely in the video, in a couple of frames, you might see uh, two faces that uh, only show or only appear when these animals are there. And in fact, the tiger, a couple of times, it runs out of the pool towards these uh, two individuals. And so by looking again for the tag MBE77 on different places, uh, I kept seeing these faces more and more. And so that began you know, um, creating the link that this face belongs to this tag, probably. And that these people are working together because uh, many uh, stories, every time these two faces showed up. So who's this person in blue then? Because we know this is MB777. Well, he was easily identified because people like this uh, tag two people together, MB77 and Safari Dubai. And so that's this team, basically. MBE and Safari Dubai. And Safari Dubai is a bit more open about um what he's doing he he keeps animals at his home which he says is a private zoo and he consistently says i'm not selling selling them but if you do a little bit of investigation you might actually come across advertisement that he in fact is selling them so how can you do this well simply by going through his instagram there was a post that showed his phone number and by searching for that phone number i came across this advertisement um, and you can see that this uh, picture is almost exactly the same. It's a frame from this video. And if you look very closely at the dates, you can see they're uploaded on the same date as well. So he's not being completely honest about what he's doing, right? He says he's just you know keeping animals, but he's actually selling them online. And so I saw he had a lion and, uh, you know, as my story began with a lion cub, and you know there were a couple of months between this post, post and this post, I thought, hey, maybe because this person you know, is bringing around uh, lions to celebrities and he's illegally selling them, um, could this be the same lion? And so 
looking very closely at details again in the pictures that I saw on, on uh, Instagram being posted by this celebrity and by this Safari Dubai, we can see that not only do the whisker spots line up exactly, but also this uh, small spot day it has on, the, on its nose also matches. Okay. And so whisker spots are relatively unique. They, they are often used as a way to identify lines and keep them apart. And so based solely of using social media, in this case, YouTube, uh, Instagram, and Google Earth, uh, we can see that um, celebrities on Instagram are getting their cups uh, and uh, exotic uh, wildlife they like to pose with from a, a rather shady network that is not honest about what they're doing, that is keeping many, many young animals in an apartment uh, in Dubai, and is also selling them uh, anonymously on the internet. Um, and so, uh, again, this is, uh, you all know how to use social media, right? Um, but it's a matter of looking very, very closely at what you're seeing, following descriptions and trying to find out, okay, who's following who? And uh, what kind of faces do I see? What kind of names uh, appear? Uh, and do I see the animals that appear in one account? Do I see them elsewhere as well? Um, it was already mentioned that uh, the wildlife trade uh, happens uh, more and more online. So these people uh, who need to sell them also occasionally need to advertise them, right? And they tend to do that in well, Instagram posts. They organize in Facebook groups. Um, and that makes it easier to investigate them if you know how to you know, use Facebook and Instagram, basically. Uh, and you can all do this from uh, basically your own comfortable desk. You, you need an internet connection, and that's about it. Um, and you need to pay uh, very close attention to uh, details. Um, so I kept it very brief. I know we're short on time. Um, if there's any questions about this later on, you can always uh, reach out to me on, on Twitter as well. I'm happy to help or uh, give you some tips and tricks later on as well. Thank you. Thank you, Fuka. That's an amazing story. Wow, tracking that down. Um, you made it sound simple. I don't think it was as simple as it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I think your point is really important that under the pandemic, I think the wildlife trade has just exploded online, and especially through social media. I'm going to turn it over to Leonardo in just a moment to, to field some questions from the audience. I wanted to ask you very quickly, uh, Fuka, if you, I mean, you know, doing what you did there are some tools that you need you need to be able to search images i think uh, maybe you need to search online databases do you have any can you point us to any resources that you or bellingcat might uh, might know about uh to help with this kinds of online investigation yeah sure um in fact this this particular investigation was done without any particular tool simply by we browse and we look very closely at pictures um but you do, so for example, uh, if you think about Google as a tool, um, everybody knows how to Google, but you can use Google in a very, very uh, more uh, efficient way than people usually do. And um, so we do have uh, guides and, and uh, sort of overviews and tips and tricks um, that we have at Bellingcat. And like I said, we like to spread this around so that anyone can participate. And so we make these guides uh, available online. And in fact, uh, the GIGN guide that was recently published is a perfect example of this as well. It, it contains a great amount of information that you can use. Uh, but there is not a specific, for example, an app or a tool or a script that you need to know. No. Thank you, Fuka. Uh, so yeah. Check out those guides at GIJN and at Bellingcat. And now I'm going to turn it over to Leonardo. Please take it away. Thank you. Well, well done, everyone. This has been fantastic so far. And we have a lot of positive comments and questions. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, so I'll be very quick. Um, the first one is for Jessette. You mentioned some tips for keeping safe in doing these stories. and. Um, could you go a little bit more into detail? Do you have any other tips or if anyone else also would like to uh, say anything about this? Um, I did mention earlier how important it is to keep your editors in the loop. 
um, and I can't emphasize that enough. Um, it's it's really important that they know the reporting that you're doing. They know where you're heading out for your field work. Um, I think that it's also important to, if you can, get in touch with some of the uh, local people that are already on the ground um, before you go out to do your reporting. So if that's another local journalist that you can reach out to, or perhaps an organization that has already been closely working in, in that area where you wanna go, um, it's also good to, to um, reach out to them and um, connect with them and let them know what you're doing. Um, there are many other tips, for instance, in ensuring, for example, I know digital security is another concern for a lot of investigative journalists. Um, there are other, um, there are many resources. I think um, they may be able to, to Google them. Um, but, but yeah, I'll, I'll turn it over. Maybe uh, the others um, have things to pitch in. Anyone else would like to answer the question? All right, I guess I mean, not. I will just say, you know, digital security is increasingly important, especially if you're doing searches online, like Fuka was doing. Uh, Internews, our, our parent organization, the Earth Journalism Network, does a wonderful job helping journalists with digital security. We have a lot of resources online for that. I'm not gonna go into all of them now, but if you wanna protect yourself digitally, I would definitely take steps. You can look at the Internews website or there's plenty of other resources online. So do think about your digital security, please. Yeah, it's very important. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, the second question uh, is, the audience would like to understand, um, they, they think sometimes wildlife uh, problems are not very hot in the news. So how can we attract more attention and how can we persuade the audience to, to basically be interested in these kinds of issues? And again, the question is open to anyone who would like to answer. So um, what I think is important, I mean, obviously finding new angles uh, helps with this, right? So telling a story that hasn't been told before or making it um, very approachable or local. Um, but I always like to think about an angle in ways that um, people themselves can sort of contribute and it's clear to them. So um, in, in the case of the celebrity uh, that I investigated, if you now go to his post uh, with the tiger, you'll see that people are commenting with my story and saying, hey, what you're doing here is wrong. Because you know these are the people that are following celebrities and they come across those posts. I can't monitor them all, but they can. Um, and so they start thinking along with um, when they consume social media about you know this story in particular. So yeah, making it sort of, making them feel as if they can participate or uh, handing them uh, the resources or tips that they can, uh, information that they need to know so they can help prevent this is I think uh, very helpful in this regard. Absolutely, yeah, that, that, that's great. Anyone else would like to say anything? I've also found that um, if you're trying to get people to care about wildlife issues who are not, your usual, you know, conservationists or animal lovers. It really helps to emphasize um, that wildlife, the illegal wildlife trade is an illegal organized trafficking network like any other. You know, talk about it in terms of the drug trade, the arms trade, the, the trade in humans. Um, you can link it to issues of, you know, societal security and to community development. The more you can link it to broader issues like that, the better chance you'll have of you know, drawing the attention of, of non-animal lovers. Yeah, and I would just add that it's often the very same people and criminal networks who are trafficking in animals that also traffic in drugs and people and weapons. So this is a, a very big story. Yeah, it's all connected. All right, we have time for one last question. Um, we, we'd like to understand um, what are the species that are the most trafficked and why? I think I'd, I'd go first. Um, 
I think globally, one of the most trafficked um, mammals is the pangolin. Um, in the Philippines, we do have the Philippine pangolin. Um, the why there is um, um, pangolin scales are believed to, to have uh, medicinal benefits. They are often used in traditional medicine, although there is no science that backs this. Um, and also because pangolins are quite relatively easy to, to poach, um, the, the way that they defend themselves is they curl into a ball. So um, poachers in the Philippines, at least, um, they usually, again, work with communities who are often very poor. Um, and, you know, in exchange for, for cash, they would um, harvest, quote unquote, uh, the pangolins um, because they do know where they live. Um, and also um, in, in my investigation, I've come across um, a lot of birds um, um, are also being um, trafficked for the pet trade, um, as well as reptiles, uh, lizards, turtles. Yeah, be interesting. Hesitant. To study. Go ahead, Rachel. I was going to say, I think we all kind of paused before <laughs> answering that question because there's really no no yeah. answer. Like Jess had said, um, pangolins is pangolins are believed to be the world's most trafficked mammal. But I mean, that's the nature of the illegal wildlife trade. Is that because it's illegal and underground, it really is impossible to say. I was going to mention, in addition to birds, uh, fish. Is the aquarium fish trade is a big, big business as well. Uh, sometimes we don't realize some of these things are sourced illegally, but it would be interesting to, to see a real study on which are the most widely trafficked animals and plants for that matter. Okay, I think that's it. Is that it, Leonardo? Leonardo? Yeah? Yeah, I think uh, we can, we're running out of time. Sure. Well, uh, thank you. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, but. Uh, before we close, I would very much like to thank GIJN and all of you out there today for joining us. Uh, a very big thank you to our speakers, Rachel, Jacette, and Fuka. And also a thanks again to the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime for supporting this webinar. Uh, be sure to check out GIJN's Twitter feed at GIJN and its website for details on future events. And if I may say, check out the At Earth Journalism Twitter feed and our website or at earthjournalism.net as well for similar webinars. We really appreciate you again joining us. Thank you all. Goodbye and be well. <laughs>